A few months ago, I talked about five easy and simple optimizations you can make to your Python code. And in this video, I thought I would do it again, talk about five more optimizations you can make to make your code even faster. Again, these range from smaller micro optimizations that save just a few milliseconds to some pretty big time saves that could save anything up to minutes in the right situations. There are a few people out there that think that Python isn't worth optimizing. And to them I say, well, why not? If you're doing something in Python for some other reason, and there are plenty of other reasons why you'd want to do something in Python, there is no harm in wanting to make your code even faster, especially if you've got something like a web service running. And if you run a loop a million times and you make that loop just one thousandth of a second faster, you save 20 minutes in total. So especially with Python, because it is not the fastest, optimizations are super important. Of course, if you found this video helpful at any point, then consider liking to let me know and maybe subscribing if you want to see more videos like this. If you're feeling particularly generous, you can go down in the description below to find out how you can become a member or a patron. But with all that out of the way, let's speed up our code even more. The first optimization I'm going to show you today is actually the smallest optimization. Uh, this is sort of like a, a bit of a trade-off between readability and speed, and I do want to make a more detailed video about that at some point. Uh, but we are comparing the speed between text.starts with, and the specific um, optimization is using slicing instead. Now, slicing does have a caveat. You do need to know how many elements um, or how many letters you want. So in this case, you need to know that the first five letters are going to equal this, which I think you probably would <laughs> most of the time. But if you were doing it in some sort of loop, then you know maybe this would be a bit more difficult to execute. Uh, but I've decided to show you the benchmarks um, every time this time around, uh, just to make it a bit clearer what's going on. So we have our text, which is just hello world. And then these first two, we are checking the best um, oh, sorry, a true case and a false case for starts with. We use a repeat this time. Uh, my friend Indently made a good video about benchmarking uh, practices and repeat is certainly like a really good one. It kind of gets rid of any variance um, and you use min to, um, to select the quickest one just for the sake of uh, speed. So we're doing this a million times by default, uh, five times over by default. Then T2 and T3 down here are comparing the true and false cases for slicing. And then we have our prints here. If we were to run all this, uh, we would get... Uh, so we can see that slicing is slightly faster. It's not particularly quicker, but it is definitely faster. Interestingly, starts with is actually faster if the case is false. And I don't know why, but this is consistent. If I run this again, it will give us... Well, not exactly the same numbers, but it will give us the same result where the false is actually quicker than true, but slicing is quicker in both senses. Uh, there is also, um, I have a multiple benchmark here. So starts with can actually take an iterable or a sequence, I should say, uh, of multiple things that it could start with um, or start with. So this is now saying if text dots, uh, starts with he, ha, hi, ho, or ha, huh, then it's true. Um, and this is also uh, doing the same thing. It's just, so this one, uh, the first case is true. This one, the last case is true. We're going to see if that makes a difference. For the slicing this time, you can use the in and then we're doing a set comparison. So this is something from the first optimizations video. And then we're doing some more printing down here. If we then run this, we can see that uh, the best case is quite a bit quicker actually and the worst case is quite a bit slower but slicing is again quicker and that's including the time it takes to create the set um, so we're actually creating the set here and then we're performing a comparison i do wonder actually is it any quicker or slower with a list instead oh it's actually a lot slower with a list oh interesting okay uh, I don't know why that is. But yes, yeah, so if you're using a list and starts with is faster, but if you take the advice from the first optimizations video, slicing is quicker using sets. Again, this is not an enormous optimization, but I did want to include it just to make a point that sometimes the most readable option isn't always the fastest option. And sometimes you do have to choose between the two. The next optimization is not being overly verbose with things all the time. 
So these are our code examples up here. So our first is a verbose one. When we check while the length of numbers is greater than zero, we pop the last number off the end of the list. And then our second one, while numbers, we do the same thing. Uh, and this in Python is called a truthy check. Um, so while numbers is essentially, well, it's, it's the same operation, you know, while there are elements in numbers is what's implied here. And for this, I've got, you know, a series of benchmarks that cover a series of list, list lengths. And then, you know, we simply just pop each time, pass a copy through so the main list isn't um, kind of destroyed. This stuff down the bottom I'll talk about in a bit. But if I do over verbose pi, we can see if I make it a bit more full screen. Uh, so this is you know, the number of elements. And we can see that generally speaking, pretty much across the board, our simple version is twice as fast as our verbose version. And that's because we are performing way more operations in this verbose version. And if I press enter to continue, like the script is telling me, this is the disassembled bytecode. And it looks very scary, but we only need to um, focus on this, on this middle column here. Or I suppose more specifically, actually the number of rows in the thing. I do want to do a more detailed video on disassembly at some point, but for now we'll just focus on the simple stuff. So this bit in the middle here where it says your load name popped up, this is the same across both. This is the pop operation, so we could ignore that. What I want to focus on is this block here. So you see we have the push none and then we have the load name, so we have to load the len function. We don't have to load numbers. We don't have to call the len function. We don't have to load zero. Um, compare to 68. Oh no, it's not 68. It's just this is something else. Um, you don't need to worry about these numbers, but we then have to compare against, well, zero. Yeah, there we go. And then we, you know, we jump to the relevant part and we actually have to do that again down here. And this bit is for the, the rest of the loop. Whereas if we just do a truthy check, you can see that we just have to load the name, the numbers, and then we, we run that pop jump is, is false operation straight away. And this, is where our time save comes from because we are cutting out what, one, two, three, four, five operations <laughs> from the middle of this. So we're cutting out this one and then we're cutting out all these. And that you know, saves a huge amount of time and you know every loop we're having to do that as well. Um, or we're saving that time as well. And that's why it's so much faster. So again, I suppose you're comparing readability against speed. Instead of being super verbose, you know, be simple, do truthy checks. A third optimization I want to show you today involves DEX. I did a video on DEX a little while ago, maybe about two or three weeks ago. Uh, so if you want to learn more about DEX, I'd recommend going and looking at that. In this video, we're doing a bit more with benchmarks, focusing a bit more on the speed. And these are the benchmarks that I wish I'd used in that video. Uh, the benchmarks in that video were not exceptionally good. They sort of showed what I wanted to explain, but these benchmarks do a much better job at it. So we'll be using these today. So what we're doing here is we're creating a list of a thousand elements between one and 100,000. And I meant to say 100,000 elements, not a thousand. And we're doing you know, more or less the same thing. For i in range len numbers, we're doing numbers.pop. And then the first one, we take a list. Second one, we're using a deck. Then we're doing popping from right. And then down here, we're doing the same thing, but we're popping from the left instead. So you can do pop zero um, to pop from the, the end of a list and then pop left um, to pop for the left of the list in the deck. And then we're printing that. So if I did pi dex pop, oops, see those is. There we go. We can see that popping from the right, in this case, decks are slightly faster, but generally speaking, they come out about the same speed. Uh, popping from the left, you can see that decks are a lot faster. And this is because it's actually the same speed to pop from the left as it is from the right with a deck because of the way they work. Again, look at that other video if you want to know. Uh, lists, they have to move everything in memory and, you know, the further to the left, the more elements they have to move. And this is why it's so much slower. If we go into our append file here, I don't know why. Oh, this is just complaining about a type hint. Fine, you can have one, my pie, just as long as you shut up. Uh, so this is the same thing, except instead of um, popping, we're appending. So in this case, we append to the right. And in this case, we append to the left, or in case of the deck, we append to the left. In case of the list, we insert at element zero, the number, and that's performing the same operation. 
You'll notice I've had to significantly reduce the number of times this benchmark is run because this one really gets slow otherwise. And it's slow anyway, actually. I probably should have been running it while I was explaining it. Um, it's Dex Appends. There you go. I'm going to move the terminal down a bit. Here we go. So you can see appending to the right lists are actually faster. Lists are designed to append to the right. If you're only ever going to append to the right, then lists are the things for you. But as you'll see, hopefully relatively soon, <laughs> If you want to do something with the left, then yeah, decks are quite a lot faster. And weirdly, when it comes to inserting, decks are faster at inserting at the left than they are to the right. And I don't know why that is. If someone does know, let me know. Generally speaking, decks are faster at inserting unless you're right at the very right end of the collection. Um, just because of the way they work. And once again, if you want more information about decks, you want to learn how they work and what they do, then I did make that video a few weeks ago for you to check out. The fourth optimization is actually something else that I've talked about on this channel before, and this is caching. Uh, and this is the direct example I, I used in that other video as well. So that will be in the cards too. And this is particularly um, you know, prominent in functions that are recursed, especially the Fibonacci sequence. This is a commonly used one because the effects of caching are, you know, so much more important. So if you were to run this without any caching at all, I probably, again, I should have really been running this because this was quite slow. Um, but you'll see it takes about like 10, 11, 12 seconds. We'll see how, how slow it comes out. But for each time, here we go, 11.4 seconds. So we're doing a, a Fibonacci of 40. And it's recursive, so you know if len is greater than, or if n, sorry, is greater than less than two, then we just return n. Otherwise, we do all this um, recursion, and then eventually we get a Fibonacci sequence out of it. Uh, and this is where caching comes in so important. So if I were to do from func tools import cache, and then simply put a cache on the end and run that again, we can see that it runs so much faster. That is literally millions of times faster. I forget exactly how many millions. <laughs> Um, I'll put it as text in the video, but in this case, to do a Fibonacci of 40 or to get a Fibonacci sequence of 40, it is literally millions of times faster. And that's just because this cache is storing the uh, return value of a function. I won't go into a huge amount of details. Again, I did make a video about this not long ago, but quick TLDR, it takes the, you know, the function name and its inputs as a key, and then it sets the return value as its um, or as the value uh, for the key. So whenever it goes to run the function, it first checks the cache. And if it's been run in that configuration before, then it knows, oh, okay, I just need to return this value. I don't need to compute anything. And that's why it's so much faster, especially when it comes to recursion, because the same things are being called over and over and over again. With caching, you avoid a lot of repeated computations. It's worth noting with caching that it's not viable all the time. If you you know, creating something that was a random number, then yeah, you're not going to want to cache that because the result is not deterministic. But for deterministic results, caching is a great solution. The final optimization for today is that NumPy is really damn fast for numerical calculations. So in this case, we have a list that has um, a thousand random numbers between one and 100. And then we create a NumPy array uh, that just uses that list. It takes that list as an input. So list and array are the same in terms of the values that they actually store. In this first example here, we are filtering the list uh, to remove any odd values. So we're basically returning a list with only even values in it. And in this second example, we're doing exactly the same thing using just NumPy's um, syntax here. And if we run this benchmark, I think this is also quite a... Uh, slow one as well. I actually made notes in my uh, notes over here on my other monitor to say whether uh, benchmarks are going to be slow or not to give me an indication to run them while I was talking about them. Completely forgot to do that. That's some good efficiency for you. Talk about benchmarks. Uh, but yes, we can see that NumPy arrays in this case are somewhere between about six and seven times faster to do this operation. This is a very simple operation if you had even more complicated things or the the array was even bigger and obviously the speed difference would be much greater. All you need to do to get NumPy on your computer if you don't have it is just do pip install uh, not bumpy NumPy <laughs> and then you'll have NumPy there's no dependencies for it which is quite nice 
and then you can just use it straight up. And the reason why NumPy is so much faster is because it is a C, I forget if it's a C library or a C extension technically, someone will correct me in the comments. Um, but yeah, it's built in C, not in Python. So while it does have a Python API, all the logic and the mathematical operations are done in C and C is obviously a lot quicker than Python is. Let me know in the comments what your favorite optimizations are, which ones you've used before, which ones you've learned. Of course, if you haven't seen the first video that I did about two uh, months ago, then that'll be in the cards. It will be the cards at the start or here at the end. Make sure to go and watch that if you haven't already. I'd like to say a huge thank you to my amazing members and patrons on screen now, especially Mazar Rushman III for being so generous. If you want to learn how to create virtual environments in Python, then make sure to check out last week's video and I'll see you in the next one for whatever we do next.